me, it is so exciting that God wants to be close to you and me. He says in James 4, 8, draw near to God. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Isn't that amazing? God wants you near. God wants you close. He wants an intimate relationship with you. It's not about religion. It is about a relationship with your God. Isn't that exciting? I hope you have the outline. And if you don't, hold up your hand. Somebody will hand you one so you can follow along. We've been talking about fresh focus, focusing on God. And it's so easy to lose our focus, so easy to just lose sight of God's promises. And, and, and so we want to come back and look at this, the fresh focus. And as we begin today, I am so excited that we have somebody here for the very first time, and that is Craig and Lonnie Swanson have little Logan Grace, just born Wednesday, and here she is, her first Sunday of her life in church. What a way to start. Isn't that great? Wow, we are so happy for Craig and Lonnie, and that is awesome. What a precious baby girl, and uh, so glad that she doesn't resemble Craig. That's great. <laughs> She's beautiful. That's great. Where'd Craig go? He was sitting there, wasn't he? Anyway, okay. Uh, we're happy. I, uh, I've known Craig since he was just a little guy, and so it's awesome, and we just praise God. But it is so easy to lose focus, is it not? And we, we, we see in, uh, in David that he lost focus. He that walks with wise men shall be wise, and so we want to learn from David. And David was a man after God's own heart. If he could lose focus, you could lose focus. I could lose focus. And so we want to learn. How did it happen to David? Well, my, he had such a great start. He was anointed by Samuel to be the next king. Uh, the Spirit of God came upon David in an unusual way at that anointing. Remember that? In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God did not live within people. That didn't happen until... Jesus went back up to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit to live within every believer. He lives within you. If you are a believer, if you've trusted Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives within you. He came upon people for certain tasks in the Old Testament days. He came upon David and used David in an amazing way. And we saw how he killed Goliath and became famous. And then we saw how he uh, married the king's daughter and then... Uh, the king's son, Jonathan, was his best friend, and, and he was a general in the king's army and was so successful that they sang, Saul has slain his thousands, David his ten thousands. And, and things were going so great for David. He just moving up. And then Saul became jealous. And so then Saul made it out that David was disloyal, and Saul sought for his life. And David had to flee, as you remember, and became a fugitive. And every day, every day, having to run for his life. If you could imagine it, it was a terrible life for David, hiding in the caves and in the mountains and Saul with his army seeking David. And during this time, uh, some men came to David, 600 men, and these were not high caliber, great character men. They were the, uh, the riffraff of, of Israel. They, they were men who were in debt and discontented and... and uh, and low character men, but they came to David, and David became their captain. And as it was, David would transform these men into great men of character and faithful men, and they would become the core of his army many years later when he, when he made Israel the greatest nation on the face of the earth with the greatest army. And, and, and so, but as they came, uh, it, it, is, it is difficult days. These are the dark dark days of David's life. Hard time. I mean, day after day after day he sought. Twice he had opportunity to kill Saul. You remember that? And he passed on it. He said, no, we will not touch God's anointed. I mean, here's a man trying to kill him. <laughs> and David would not, would not respond. And, and, and David wrote most of the Psalms and the Psalms are almost like reading David's journal and his diary. And just listen to this, not on the screen, but how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? 
How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Do you see the burden of his heart? Do you see the heaviness? Uh, this is a broken man. He, he is just, uh, it, it is very hard. So much so that David just became weary. Do you ever get weary? Do you know the Bible warns against that? It warns us because it's a, it's, it's a temptation for every one of us. The Bible says, Hebrews 12, 4, Consider him who endured such hostility by sinners, lest you become weary and lose heart. Galatians 6, 9, let's not be weary in well-doing and give up. You know, God warns us about this. Don't wear out. Be careful. Life's a marathon. Pace yourself. Do you know the number one mistake marathoners make? <laughs> I know, because I've made it. We go out too fast, and we forget how far it is. And, and, and we get caught up in the enthusiasm, and then in the last... Last miles, we pay for it. And, 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 and life is that way. And we must be careful. We must guard our hearts. We must watch ourselves. And, 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 and this is where David is. David is just, I mean, he's drained. He is just, he's just drained. And uh, I, I, I was watering some trees this week. I got a couple of new trees I've planted. And I have these five-gallon buckets of water. And I'm <laughs> filled them up with water and walking down to these trees and, and uh, unbeknownst to me, one of the buckets had a, had a crack in the bottom. <laughs> and when I got there, it didn't have much water left in it. You know? <laughs> I thought, man, this one's lighter. <laughs> I looked at it, and I had a trail of water all the way. You know? <laughs> and you know what? I didn't know. And, and, and you know what? Life can be that way. You don't really realize, you know, it's just going out. I'm draining out. I got nothing left. And, 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 and we must guard against this. This is where David is. This is where David is. It just has gone out of him until it came finally. And remember, it's almost a decade, nine plus years, he's on the run. I mean, it's a distant memory of Samuel anointing him to be the next king. <laughs> that happened way back when he was a teenage boy. And, and now... In fact, Samuel passed off the scene. He died. And it's like, where's God? What's going on? I don't see any fulfillment of his promises. I tried to do right. I didn't slay Saul. I could have. And God, where, where's your blessing? Where's your blessing, God? I don't see your blessing. Have you ever been there? It finally comes to a tipping point, 1 Samuel 27, and this, we've seen this verse again and again, but I want you to see it. Then David said to himself, now I will perish one day by the hand of Saul. I'm going to get killed. Saul's going to get me. There's nothing better for me than to escape into the land of the Philistines. What? You're going to leave Israel? You're going to go to the enemy? <laughs> what? Saul will despair of searching for me in all the territory of Israel. I will escape. I will escape. This is, this is my will. You know, this is, I will do this. <laughs> sin, that's the essence of sin. My will over God's will. I'm going to do my thing, God. There's no indication here that David sought the mind of God in this decision. He said to himself, he's thinking we get to see his own thinking. He's not talking to God. He's not seeking God. I will do this. I'm going to take things in my own hands because God's not doing anything. Well, God loves you too much. He loves me too much to live like that. For David goes to the land of the enemy, and you remember we saw it last week. He had to cover up. He had to lie. King Achish was the king over Ziglag area where David was. And, and, and David would make these raids and come back and Achish said, where'd you go? And he would say, yeah, and, and he lied. And, and, and whenever you and I get out of God's will and we live in sin, we have, to co we have to cover up. We have to live a lie. We have to put on a front. And we come to church and we look real good. But inside we know something's not right. 
And we're religious, but we're not godly. We're not really enjoying our walk with God. We're not close to God as he's called us. Come close to me and I'll be close to you. And so what does God do? He loves me too much. He loves you too much to let us live like that. Hebrews 12, 11 says, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. You see what God's trying to bring in my life and your life? Righteousness. Character. God is more interested in your character than he is your comfort. And so he may allow some sorrow to come into your life. And that's what he does with David. And I want you to see it here. And... Uh, this is, uh, this is what happened. We have a crisis of grace, and God allows a crisis to come into the life of David, and he disciplines him, a crisis of grace. David, remember last week, tried to get, get into the Philistine army, and, and, and he, they're going to war against Israel, and I don't know what David was thinking, but he and his 600 men tried to get in on that and go with the Philistines. Oh, my. And you, and you look back and say, what was he thinking? Have you ever done that in your life? Look back on your life and said, what was I thinking during this time? What was I? <laughs> Sin never makes sense. It's not logical. It's moral insanity. And, and so David and his men are sent back. They will not let them go to battle. The Philistines said, no, they could turn on us. And, and so... They are sent back, and we have a crisis of grace, and I want you to see 1 Samuel 30. Then it happened when David and his 600 men came to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had made a raid on the Negev, which is south, uh, on Ziglag, and had overthrown Ziglag and burned it with fire. And they took captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great, without killing anyone, and carried them off and went their way. And David and his men came to the city. Now, this is their city where they've been in the, in the Philistine territory, Ziglag. And when they came back to their city, behold, it was burned with fire. Their wives, their sons, their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with them lifted up their voices and wept till there was no strength in them to weep. Can you see it? These great, big, strong men with their faces in their hands, literally weeping and wailing. They've lost their children. They've lost their family. They've lost everything. I mean, this is disaster. Ziglag was destroyed. The Amalekites had come and, and, and taken everything. This is the hand of God. Does, does God create evil? Not at all. But does God use evil? Oh, Yes. Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. Did God, was that the will of God? Not at all. Did God use it? Romans 8, 28, God makes all things work together for good. Then say all things are good. Not everything comes into my life is good. Not everything comes in. No, but God uses even the bad to bring character into my life, into your life. And this is bad in David's life. It is a crisis of grace, and God is using it. And these men, 600 men, they are broken. They are weeping until they could weep no more. They had no more strength to weep. It is unbelievable. Their hearts are crushed. And then I want you to see that this remorse turns to resentment. And we see it in verses 5 and 6. Now David's two wives had been taken Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite. Moreover, David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him. Whoa! <laughs> you know, before, when David was a fugitive all these years, Saul was seeking his life, and he, there was a step between him and death, he said, and it was a tough time, a horrible time. But he had his men. He had some friends. Now, things have gone for David, from bad to worse. He's gone, as we say sometimes, from the frying pan to the fire. <laughs> this is really bad. His own men are saying, let's kill him. 
When things go bad, who gets the blame? The head coach. <laughs> I won't go there, but if things don't get turned around. Uh, and David is the head coach. And I'm sure some of them said, we should have left 200 men back here. Why did we all 600 go? And David, who was really a military genius, I mean, God made him that. God gave him. And, 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 but this is a major screw-up. The people sto spoke of stoning him. And all the people were embittered. Each one, because of his sons and daughters. Remorse turned to resentment. They are angry. They are mad. We need to kill him. And I love this last line, but David strengthened himself in the Lord. This is the first time in one year and four months since David went to the land of the Philistines, the enemy territory. First time we have even seen David talk to God. Staggering, isn't it? The man after God's heart put God in the back seat of his life and took over the steering wheel. I'm glad I've never done that of you. We all have this horrible temptation. You know that? We must learn. Now David is coming to God. This is what a crisis is all about. David's back is against the wall. David has nowhere else to go. He's on his face before God, saying, God, I don't know what to do. God, you've got to help me. This is the hand of God. We see it in Hebrews chapter 12. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint, faint when you are rebuked by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. That's an important line right there. It's a sign that God loves you when he disciplines you. And he scourges every son whom he receives. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we, we respected them. Shall we not much rather be in subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good. Why? So that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. I don't like sorrow. I, I, I don't like, uh, it, but he said right here, it is God working. God will use it. And I, and I want you to write this down. What does God do to you and me when we get out of his will as a child of God? He kicks us right out of his family. No, no, I want you to write this down. God does not disown us. He disciplines us. No more than you disown your kids when they disobey. You discipline them in love. Your heavenly father loves you. He will not disown you. He will discipline you. He will discipline you because he loves you. Because he wants more for you than enemy territory. And a life of, I will. He's got more for you than that. And so he will discipline you. And he never quits, according to Philippians 1.6. He who began a work in you is still working. Isn't that great? He doesn't give up on me. I'm so glad he doesn't give up, aren't you? <laughs> and he's developing. We saw this verse last week. I got to show it to you again, Psalm 78. So he, David, shepherded them, Israel, according to the integrity of his heart and guided them with his skillful hands. This is a summary of David's ministry, his life. The integrity of his heart, that's character. And skillful hands, that's competence. These are the two things you and I have to have to be successful in life. And everybody focuses on competency. I've got to learn a skill. I've got to go to school. I've got to prepare. And yes, that's good. Should do that. Yes. But we forget something is way more important than that. It's called character. 
Character is what you really are when nobody's looking. Character is the real you. Runners say that remember the core, you know. Remember the core. If you don't develop the core as well as the legs and the lungs, you're in trouble. And it's the and 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 so character is doing right, not just doing what you feel like doing. And, and, and so God is developing character. Why? Because David's going to the throne. He will be king 40 years. He needs to know God. He needs to have a relationship with God that is close. And God is preparing him for that. God is working in his life. And so David goes to God. Now, it's a good thing that God is God, and I'm not God, and you're not God. Because if David would have come to me, I'd have probably said, David, you made your bed lay in it. You came over to enemy territory. You figure it out. Now you come to me after 16 months. No, that's not our Heavenly Father. That might be me, might be me, you. That's not our Heavenly Father. He's loving. Do you remember the parable Jesus told in Luke 15 about the daddy who had two boys and one of them asked for his inheritance and went off in enemy territory, so to speak, zigzag, and wasted it. And then finally came to himself and, and he came home. And when he came home, dad said, yeah, about time you came home. You blew it. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Luke 15, verse 20. See what that daddy did? He saw him when he was coming way off. He was looking. He came and running. He kissed him. He hugged him. He said, bring the, bring the, bring the robe, bring the sandals, bring the ring for his finger, uh, the family ring, which was the credit card. I wouldn't give that kid a credit card for nothing. And, 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 and kill the fatted calf. It's party time. My son's home. Listen, in that story, the daddy is God. You and I are the, you and I are the runaway. When you come back to God, I'm telling you, he's not like Carl Godwin. He's not like some of us here. He will receive you with outstretched arms. He will come running to meet you. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. He wants you back. Well, I'm in enemy territory. God wants you back. And I'm telling you, he's calling you. He will receive you. He will love you. You don't know what I've done, Pastor Carl. I'm telling you, he is... If you will come clean with God, not cover up, he will, I'm telling you, it is amazing what our Heavenly Father will do. He is gracious. We could, you know, we call this Luke 15, we call it the parable of the prodigal son. It could be called the parable of the gracious father. The gracious father. What a Heavenly Father we have. David sought God. God brought David to the place where the only thing he had was God. (laughs) That's all he had. It wasn't his competency anymore. It wasn't his great skill. Nothing could get him out of this mess. He needed God. I love what Ron Moore said. When God is all you have, God is all you need. Isn't that good? When God is all you have, God is all you need. We read Psalm 119. David said, my soul weeps because of grief. Strengthen me according to your word. This is David pouring out his heart to God. Grief. I am overcome with grief, God. My, my family's been lost. My, 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 uh, my, all my men have lost their families. Tragedy has come, God. My soul weeps. Because of grief. He's weeping. I mean, weeping from the inner soul. This is, this is a broken-hearted man. He is confessing it to God. You know, it is our weakness that demonstrates God's strength. When we really see ourselves for what we are, we really see our need, don't we? I am so weak. You are so weak. We like to put on like, oh, man, I got it all together. <laughs> I am able to handle it. I am uh, no problem. I got it. Got my ducks in a row. No. Here's even David who's saying, Lord, I, I'm in over my head. I don't know what to do. What did it, how did it get, 
I want you to see again for Samuel 27. I'm going to read this again. This will be the last Sunday. We're about done. But I want you to see this verse. And I'm going to read it. And I'm going to emphasize the personal pronouns. Listen to this. Now I will perish one day by the hand of Saul. There's nothing better for me than to escape into the hand of the Philistines. Saul then will despair of searching for me anymore in the territory of Israel, and I will escape from his hand. You see how, who David's thinking about? Is he thinking about God's glory? He's thinking about David. When I get to that place, I make bad, bad decisions, and so do you. This is where David is. I'm going to take things in my own hands. Now he sees his weakness. Like Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, my grace is sufficient for you, God said to Paul. My power is perfected in weakness. Boy, when we see our weakness, we hook up with God. God begins to do some things in our lives, and it is amazing. And here's what David does in 1 Samuel 30. He, he calls to Abathar, the priest, and he says, bring me the epid. So Abathar brought the epid to David, and David inquired of the Lord. This is the first time. Do you know all through David's life, as you read his life story, that little sentence, you see it again and again. David inquired of the Lord. David inquired of the Lord. David, again and again. But we haven't seen it now for quite some time because he's been in enemy territory for 16 months. And now here he is inquiring of the Lord. Lord, shall I pursue this man? Shall I overtake them? And he said, pursue, for you will surely overtake them. This is God speaking in response to David inquiring. The epithet in that day was an ornate vest worn by the priest, and it was used to discern God's guidance. How did they discern? I don't know. I don't, I, there were some colorful stones on that breast, and I don't know if some of them sort of, sort of, uh, you know, when they asked, I, I don't know. But I do know this, we don't have that today. We don't have that today. What do we have? We have a completed Bible. We have something David didn't have. David did not have a completed Bible. We have a complete revelation from God. We have the inner abiding Holy Spirit that David, those people didn't have in those days. And, and his sheep know his voice. And so we have a guidance a better guidance system even that they had at that time. Our guidance is found in Scripture. It is God's love letter to you. And God wants to guide your life. God wants to speak to you. He will. He will. He will speak to you. And that's our guidance. Now I want you to see what happened. First Samuel 30. Oh, wait a minute. God gave David help. Oh, yes. I forgot to say this. Every now and then I forget something. That's so very important and you need. <laughs> Before we read 1 Samuel 3, I want you to see this. God gave David help. We're going to see how God helps David. You see, I don't need any help to go to enemy territory. Do you? I can do that on my own. I can do that with my own sinful heart. And so can you. But to get out of enemy, enemy territory, I need help. I need help. And so do you. And I need God to help me. I, I need people to help me. I need, you know, it's recovery is what it is. Recovery's hard. Life is a fight. Life is a battle. It's a spiritual battle, that is. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual powers and spiritual wickedness and high blood. Uh, Ephesians 6, 12. And so here it is. David needs help. God gives him help. Let's read it. 1 Samuel 30. So David went, he and the 600 men who were with him, and they came to the brook Bezor, and where those who left behind remained. But David pursued, he and 400 men, for 200 were too exhausted to cross the brook Bezor and re remained behind. So here's what they did. They're, they're pursuing these Amalekites who had destroyed Ziglag and took their families. And when they came to the brook, 200 of them are just absolutely exhausted. I think what happened is a lot of the men just took off some of their extra baggage. You know, they had backpacks on. <laughs> I don't know what they had, but, you know, they're warriors. And, and some things maybe they said, well, hey, I can travel lighter. And so 200 men stayed with the baggage. And so David went on. 
and left 200 behind, 400 men. Now they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread and he ate and they provided him with water to drink. They gave him a piece of fig cake, two clusters of raisins, and he ate and his spirit revived for he had not eaten for, or drunk water for three days and three nights. David said to him, to whom do you belong? Where are you from? And he said, I'm a young man of Egypt, a servant of an Amalekite, and my master left me behind when I fell sick three days ago. Huh. Isn't this something? We made a raid on the south of the Cherethites and on that which belongs to Judah and in the south of Caleb, and we burned Ziglag with fire. Here's a servant. And they came across him. What a coincidence. Oh, what a coincidence. They would be going along and find somebody. I love God's coincidences, don't you? The hand of God is what this is. Can you look back over your life and say, oh, I remember a time when God brought this person in my life, when God did this, and God did, oh, my. It was just, let's read on. And David said to him, will you bring me down to this band? And he said, swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master. I will bring you to this band. Oh, ho, ho, ho. this is the hand of God. God is answering David's prayer. God is more patient than I would ever be, and God just steps up and helps David to get out of enemy territory and to get this is amazing here's a guy who uh, had been three days and three nights with nothing to eat he fell sick his master said hey you're no good to me you just stay here and die and they went on and left him there and sure enough he would be the guide to David and his men to bring them to these people amazing God has given David help you and I need help time and again And the grace of recovery, I want you to see this, involves a battle. It's a fight. It's a fight. It is a spiritual battle. And we read in 1 Samuel 30. When he had brought them down, behold, they were spread over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing, because all the great spoil they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. And David slaughtered them from twilight to until the evening of the next day, and not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. So David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken and rescued his two wives. But nothing of theirs was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything they had taken for themselves. David brought it all back. So David captured all the sheep and the cattle which the people drove ahead of the other livestock, and they said, this is David's spoil. (laughs) When David connected with God, God began to work in his life. And this is an amazing victory. I want you to know the devil's the king of Ziglag. And he's saying to you, you can never leave Ziglag. I've got you in enemy territory. This is where you're going to be forever. But I want you to know, if you will seek God, God will help you. God worked in an amazing way with David. And God helped him. And David regained all they had lost. And they're bringing it back. And I just want you to see that those who receive grace should be grace givers. Sometimes God has given you and me so much grace, and yet we have so little patience with anybody else. I'm not going to cut you any grace. Uh Uh-uh. Oh, no. But God has given me so much grace. I'm sure God just shakes his head and says, come on, Carl. I have given you so much grace and you are so... I want you to see how David gives grace here. As he comes back, remember they left 200 men back. When David came to the 200 men who were too exhausted to follow David and had also been left at the brook Bezor, they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. Then David approached the people and greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless men, among whom those who went with David, and and by the way, when God calls them worthless, nobody's worthless in God's sight. What he meant was worthless in character because these are low-character men that that David is working with. And when all the wicked and worthless men, among those who went with David, the 400 men, said, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil we've recovered. 
except to give every man his wife and children that they may lead them away and depart. They can get out of here. And I want you to see what David said. Then David said, you must not do so, my brothers. Notice what he calls them, my brothers. I'd have called them jerk faces. You must not do so, my brothers. Hey, David has a tender heart, doesn't he? He's come back to God. That's the spirit of God. You must not do so, my brothers. With what the Lord has given us, who has kept us and delivered into our hand the band that came against us. You see what? L- l- listen to what David's saying. My brothers, the Lord has done this. God has given us this victory. Please understand that, my brothers. David knew where the victory came from. It came from God. David knew it. And so he is gracious. He is tender with these guys who are being jerks, and he is tender with the 200 who didn't go. And and then he said, who will listen to you in this matter? In this matter, in other words, I'm not going to listen to you guys with this unreasonable thing. For as his, and, and here's the principle that David gives, which will become a principle, a statute in Israel from this day forward. For as his share is who goes down to the battle, so shall his share be who stays by the baggage. They shall share alike. So it has been from that day forward that he made it a statute and an ordinance. That was in Israel from that day forward. We may not all get to go to the mission field, but we can all send, you know. We can all be a part. And that's what David said. Everybody's a part of the victory. Everybody had a part. And we're going to know we're going to share the spoil with everybody. We're not going to be small. Grace receivers should be grace givers. Well, let me just tell you this. Time won't allow me. We will not look further. But in the next chapter, it tell, you remember, remember the Philistines were par- preparing for a great battle. Remember that? And David tried to get in on that and how God really moved the heart of those Philistine kings to keep him out of that battle because a great battle took place in the next chapter, 1 Samuel 31. It's the last chapter of 1 Samuel. And in that battle up on Mount Gilboa, Saul and his three sons were killed. It's a good thing David hadn't been there. He'd probably never been king. And then we turn a page or two into 2 Samuel chapter 2, and David is made king of Judah. Seven years he reigns over southern and Judah, and then 33 years over the whole nation. God put his hand on this man's life. And I just want to say in closing, David was not a perfect man. You and I are not perfect. And sometimes we give up on God's promise or we get weary and we, but I just want you to know God loves you. He is a gracious father. He, will, he does not want you to live in zigzag, enemy territory or whatever. He, he does not want you to live a life of cover-up, a life of lies. He wants you to live reality. He wants you to be real. He wants you to be close to him. Not religious, but a relationship. That's what he has for you. He wants you to be king (laughs) over the dominion he's given you. That's what he's got for you. He's got something very exciting, very wonderful. You and I can miss it, miss out on it, but we need not. We need not. He's called us. Draw near to me. I will be drawing near to you, a close relationship between you and God. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you so much for we see David regaining a fresh focus, a new glimpse, coming back to you. And you put your hand on him in an amazing way. Thank you, God. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. We are waiting before God for a few minutes a few seconds here I invite you in your heart right now 
Would you talk to God? I remind you again today, He loves you very much. But He also loves you and me too much to leave us in a life of cover-up. He wants reality in your life. He's calling you to it. It'll take a fight to get out of zigzag, a battle. But God will help you. He will help you as He helped David. Will you talk to him? He loves you more than I could ever explain to you. You matter to him. May you feel that and sense that today. He's reaching out to you today. Pastor Carl, you don't know what I've done. You don't, I don't need to know. I don't want to know. He knows and he still loves you. Yes, he does. Thank you, Heavenly Father. You are an awesome God. Your love is beyond our comprehension that you could love us is just amazing we are just blown away by it dear God but we thank you thank you thank you so much thank you for letting us walk with this wise man and to see his imperfections his failures and to see that you used him. Thank you, God. Thank you that David strengthened himself in you and came back to you. I pray that we would know that in our lives. Bless each one. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.